started with, I don't know, did everyone see that Nancy Reagan passed, Nancy Reagan passed away last week? Okay. So a, a real friend of our church is Don Muma, who was the pastor up at Bel Air for uh, about 30 years, and the Reagans were there with him. And I spoke with him this week about his role in their service, in the service for, for Nancy. Um, they had a family service two days before the Friday memorial, and he spoke there um, at, at, at length with the family, but didn't speak at the, uh, the service they had on Friday. It was nationally televised. In fact, we do have that service um, available on our website, right, Joel, and our Facebook page. So our website, would, would have, we've got a link for the service. I want to encourage you to check it out. I, I, was, really, um, I was really impressed with um, the role that the Lord was given in that service. Um, that, was, that was a very important and, um, and special thing. And, you know, we talk about the, the, the role of faith and the leadership of our country. And when you talk with Don, you, you can't help but be touched by the real deep evident faith that uh, President Reagan had when he was in office. And um, you see the value of that. And certainly that was evident in the, uh, in the service that we had on Friday. So again, I would encourage you if you didn't see it, to, uh, to check out that uh, service of um, the YouTube video on our website from that, that broadcast. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 today, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. You can turn there with me in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. Paul writes for us these words. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Very, very important choice of words. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know Him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. It's a great passage talking about how those that that are wise in the world standards to miss that which is God's truth. Um, and this message really hits on that reality for us. So let's pray together. Lord, we want to know you. We want to understand your wisdom. Lord, there are, there are many things that we can seek as truth. And Lord, let us always choose You. Help us to understand the value of the cross. Help us, Lord, to have a, a right understanding of what You did for us. And what that means for us every day. We are grateful, Lord, to you. We pray that you would speak to us in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. I did youth ministry before I was pastor here. Um, and one message, or one thing stood out to me a lot as I, as I worked on this message. Um, I had two sets of kids that I had to minister to in my time as a youth pastor. And um, one of them, the first set, had some really smart kids who were just really confused. 
Um, there was one guy, he was a, he was a C- minus student through college, but he did other people's homework assignments for $10 an assignment. So he made a lot of money doing everyone else's homework, but didn't do his own. It's a true story. And, uh, and one time we were having a youth group meeting, and um, you know, he spoke up and he said, I've gone to church all my life. I've done, so he's been religious and attending, but he said, I don't understand why the Christian faith is different. Why is it better than any other religion or belief system? Why is it better? Why should I like it more? Why does it matter what belief system I pick? And it led me to the question, what is at the heart of our faith as Christians? What is at the heart? I mean, what is that, when you, when you whittle down all the other stuff, what's at the heart of what we believe and why we believe it? Why does it matter? I had a class with Richard Mao, who was the president of Fuller Seminary. He's since retired. But he taught a class called Christ and Culture. And he used a term called bricolage. Has anyone heard of this term? It's kind of a fancy theological term. It's called bricolage. It's where someone can go along to a bunch of different belief systems and pick the things they like. Does that sound good? And it's become quite popular where someone will say, okay, I like this part of Christianity and this part of Buddhism and this part of, you know, psychics and astrology and I'm going to put it all together and it's going to be my faith. And oftentimes these things don't actually correlate. They don't actually, like they can't exist but for together, if, if you know what you're talking about, but they just, they like the idea of picking what they like and throwing away what they don't like and saying this is it for me. And it's actually become pretty popular in our culture. I love Jesus, but let me tell you about my astrology sign today. Let me talk to you about conjuring up the dead. Which, of course, we don't do as Christians because... You know. <laughs> what? We just don't do that, right? They are in peace with the Lord, right? And at the heart of our faith, is the cross. At the heart of our faith is the cross because at the cross, Christ, for us, did the most miraculous, abundant act of love the world has ever known. And it defines who we are. It defines who we are. Christ and what he's done defines who we are. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.23, we proclaim Christ crucified. But, but why, why crucified? What is that? Why is that important? You know, in the ancient Roman world, crucifixion was a bestial form of execution revealing the very depths of human evil. It was a political or military punishment for very severe crimes. I mean, think about it for a moment, if you will. People were stretched out on wooden boards, sometimes for days, until their own lungs filled with fluid and finally died of that. It was excruciatingly painful. In fact, people would be crucified along the roads, usually, so that people who were walking along the roads would see what happened if you made the Romans mad. The people would be, would be up on the crosses crying out in pain. I mean, understand, in the eyes of the world, the fact that we have a cross as a symbol of new life, it's like me going over and putting an electric chair on a necklace. I mean, what would you think if you saw someone with an electric chair on, their, on a necklace or on their arm or on the back of their car? It was a symbol of, of excruciating Execution. 
Does anyone ever see the movie Spartacus? The old, great, yeah, Kurt Douglas. Cool. Only a few of us in the service, as many as left. There, 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 was a, uh, there was a real Spartacus who was a, who was a, a slave in Rome, and, um, and he did leave a slave revolt, and he actually lost. And him and 6,000 other of the slaves who revolted were crucified along the road of the Appian Way. And people saw them for miles crucified as a symbol of what happens if you go against the Roman rule. It was, it was, crucifixion was state-sponsored terrorism in Rome. And it happened, there were four categories of people that fell into crucifixion. The first one was mutinous people. Crucifixion was, was used to scare them into submission, like Spartacus. Second category was conquered peoples. So if you were conquered, you're thinking about revolting against Rome, you'd see what would happen if you did and you wouldn't do it anymore. The third category was rebellious cities. So if a city who was under Roman rule rebelled, the Roman army would go out and they would besiege the city, and if people came out looking for food or water, they'd capture them and they'd crucify them facing the city. And they'd say, you need to um, let us in and, and surrender or you're going to be crucified like these guys. And the fourth one was for robbers, criminals, and slaves. And it's assumed that Jesus was crucified as one of these. And he was hung by criminals. He was accused of leading a rebellion against Rome, even though he never formed an army. And he was labeled by Pilate as the king of the Jews. The people wanted him crucified because, the, the Jewish leaders wanted him crucified because of Deuteronomy 21, verses 22 through 23, which reads this. If a man guilty of a capital offense is put to death and his body is hung on a tree, you must not leave his body on the tree overnight. Be sure to bury him that same day because anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. So they believed that if they hung him on a tree, that he would be cursed by God. And God used all of this wisdom of the world to do the greatest of miracles. I mean, it must have been extreme foolishness to have a cross become the symbol of resurrection life. Because up to that point, it had only been the symbol of brutal death. And God took the symbol of brutal death and made it the symbol of life. In verse 19, Paul references Isaiah 29, verse 14, which says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Throughout human history, since Christ, people have argued that what God says is wrong. Anyone else experience this? They've argued it since the beginning of history that what God's word says is wrong, it's inaccurate, we've discovered, we've got a new discovery. This guy did this theory and all of a sudden the world is flat. You heard this one? Throughout the years, science has said this, the findings have said that, yet God's word has always stood up. God's word has always been the key to life. In Romans 1, 21 through 23, Paul says these words for, this is when people, God had made them into a prosperous nation, Israel, but, but they became so convinced of their own wisdom. And it says these words, for though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and it, in their senseless mind, and their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling a mortal human being, or birds, or four-footed animals, or reptiles. Paul's saying to us, the only way to understand God's word is through the Spirit. Not through our human pride or understanding, but through the Spirit. So we always say, Lord, help me to understand what your word is saying. The 
the message of the cross is our reality. The message of the cross says that because Jesus died on the cross and because he took that sacrifice for me, forever I am a different person. Forever my identity is changed. Does that make sense? Forever my identity is one who has been rescued and is one who was worthy to God of the price of Christ. So my identity, what I carry and who I am, needs to, needs to be in light of that. There's so many believers who don't understand the power they carry, the reality of who they are, what they've been entrusted with, what defines them. And I think that if we can live in light of what defines us, our lives would look a lot different. Does that make sense? The cross is just a starting point. It's just the beginning. We say yes, we come into salvation, and that's the beginning of the journey, not the end. It's like going into the most magnificent house you've ever seen and walking in the door and standing in the walkway. The cross is, is, the, is the doorway. It's the very beginning of that new life that God invites us into. And we come in, and so many, it seems like we stay, I've suggested Christ, and we stop there, and he's saying it's just the beginning. It's just the launching pad to a great new reality of everything in my life changing because God's in my boat. What Jesus did for us on the cross sets us apart from every other religion, from every other belief system. And it's understanding that price that's been paid, what our new identity is in Jesus, that enables us to experience that life in the full, that John 10.10 10 passage which says, Jesus says, I came to give them life and life in the full. That abundance of life, that ability to forgive the person who the world would say is unforgivable. That ability to pray for a person who we otherwise would want to run away from. That ability to love beyond ourselves. That ability to look at a situation that looks hopeless and say, God can bring victory in that situation. That's the reality that we have now that we have, now that we are in Christ because of the cross. The greatest miracle enables us to have a life of breakthrough and miracles. It's the gospel realized. The gospel is full of amazing stories which show us who God is and what he wants to see in our lives. Not staying captive to the wounds that have been inflicted upon us, but finding breakthrough and letting those wounds actually be a strength for our ministries, for our lives, for who we are. And it all happens because of what he did for us on the cross. Let's pray together. Lord, it's so important that we understand who we are. That we live in light of the price that you paid to save us and to redeem us. Lord God, our identity as believers is so important. Help us to understand that what you did on the cross didn't stop there, but that it was only the beginning Help us to see what looking at life through your wisdom, your word, looks like. Lord, help us to see those areas that we find challenging and to understand your truth, your goodness in those passages, in those challenging areas of life. Lord, let us be a people who, more know, who are known because we are your people. That you have called to live lives of extraordinary significance in the world around us. 
Lord, help us to step into that which you have invited us into, life in the Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to have faith that is a direct revelation of what you promise and of who you are. Lord, give us your wisdom. Give us boldness and courage to discover and to step out in faith, Lord God, as you invite us to. We thank you, Lord, for this time together. Let us truly be your people. Knowing who we are and whose we are. And the greatness of life with you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us spread the message. Click on the donate button below or go to shermanoakspc.org forward slash donate. Thank you.